How we know it isn't so. How we know what isn't so. Is it possible to know something that's not true? I think we can believe a lot of things, and ultimately what we believe is not aligned with the way things really are. And that's one of the things that I really think about when I develop courses at Vanderbilt University. And one of them is called Judgment and Analytical Reasoning. And the purpose of the course is to teach students about cognitive illusions and how to overcome them. And so in this very short video, I'd like to describe to you one of the lessons from that course. Uh, there are many more, uh, but I think it'll give you an idea of what we're trying to accomplish. Now, the reason why I even created the course in the first place was because of my background in the field of technology forecasting, I'm very interested in about cutting edge technologies and where they're gonna be in five or 10 years. And once you have, or understand where technologies are gonna be, you understand the kinds of businesses that are going to be required to create that product or service. And then once you know what the business is like, you can get some understanding of the kinds of workers that are gonna be required in that business. And you can understand the kinds of skills they're gonna need. Well, some really smart researchers at Oxford Martin and Nesta and Pearson and, and other organizations did exactly that. And so in this book called The Future of Skills, they took a look at future companies, future workers, and the kinds of skills that would be required. And the number one skill on the list was judgment and decision making. And when I read that report, I said, I need to create a course at Vanderbilt called Judgment and Decision Making. I changed it slightly to judgment and analytical reasoning because I wanted to include that part about judgment, but I also wanted to teach a component about skills, skills and analytical reasoning. So the course is really half applied cognitive psychology about how our brains are not necessarily uh, always right and how we uh, view stimuli, stimuli in the environment. There are optical illusions that fool us, but there are also cognitive illusions that fool us. And then the other half of the class is about Microsoft Excel. It's a nuts and bolts course, a uh, series of lectures and lessons on using Excel and all of its uh, capabilities. And for this course to allow students to create calculators and other tools that help them to think more objectively about the information being presented to them. Ways to support limitations of human information processing. And so this lecture will describe one example. So let's start off with a question. If a woman's mammogram is positive, what's the likelihood she actually has cancer? Right, so that's a pretty straightforward question. What do you think the answer is? Is it 100%? Is it 90%? Is it 50%? Or is it less than 10%? If a woman gets a positive indication from a mammogram that she has cancer, what's the likelihood she actually has cancer? Well, let me give you some information so you can do better than just gut instinct. Mammograms are 90% accurate in spotting those who actually have cancer. This is called the sensitivity of the test. So if 10 women walk in, all 10 have cancer, we know it as a matter of fact, nine times out of a 10, out of 10, the mammogram will spot that cancer. They are 93% accurate in spotting those who don't have cancer. This is called the specificity of the test. So if 100 women come in, the test will only say seven of those women have cancer that actually don't. So it's actually a little bit more accurate in determining who doesn't have cancer than who does. But it's 93% accurate in that regard. And finally, 0.8% or eight women out of 1,000 uh, who routinely get mammograms have breast cancer. This is called the prevalence of the disease. So now you know the sensitivity of the test, you know the specificity of the test, and you know what's called the prevalence or the base rate. So let me ask you again. If a woman's mammogram is positive, what's the likelihood that she has cancer? 100%, 90, 50, or less than 10? Now, surveys have shown that most lay people and even most doctors guess 90%. And I guess that makes sense. If the sensitivity is 90%, the specificity is 93%, then maybe the accuracy is somewhere around 90%. Seems reasonable. The actual answer is a little bit less than 10%. And think about that. If a woman goes in and gets a mammogram and the mammogram indicates that she has cancer, the likelihood she actually has cancer is less than 10%. 
Now, to me, especially when I first heard about that, it was mind-blowing. And even now, it seems really strange. And that's the way cognitive illusions work. Illusions in general, if you think about optical illusions, it doesn't matter how often you explain to the person that these two lines are the same length or these two colors are the same shade of gray, whatever that optical illusion is. You can explain it all you want. It still doesn't look that way. And that's the way cognitive illusions work. I can explain it to you, but it still doesn't seem right. And we're going to go through the numbers so you can experience that for yourself. So most people assume that the probability that you have cancer if you get a positive test result is equal to the probability that you get a positive test result if you have cancer. Okay, and this uh, statement down here in green is basically how that gets written. The probability of cancer given a positive test equals the probability of a positive test given cancer. Yeah, that's just not true. The probability that you have cancer if you get a positive test result is not equal to the probability that you will get a positive test result if you have cancer. And that's what fools people. The way to be unfooled, or the way to not be fooled, is to use something called Bayes' theorem. Now, oftentimes when Bayes' theorem is taught, there's a complex equation that's presented with a lot of terms that are kind of non-intuitive, and I try to avoid that. I'd rather that students could understand Bayes' theorem in a more natural way that they could pull out a napkin and a pen and, and draw out a little diagram and figure it out for themselves without having to resort to an equation. And let me walk you through that process right now. Sir Harold Jeffries, who was a statistician, a mathematician, a geophysicist, and an astronomer, said Bayes' theorem is to the theory of probability what the Pythagorean theorem is to geometry. So most of you studied geometry, you probably remember the Pythagorean theorem, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, allow you to calculate um, the lengths of lines of a triangle. Super useful. But how many of you actually learned Bayes' theorem? Uh, and how many of you actually studied probability? Much more useful, as you'll see shortly, um, but most people don't know it. And so let's get straight into our matrix. Uh, there's four possibilities uh, if you go get a cancer, or a test for cancer, right? You get a mammogram. Uh, let's look at the, uh, across the horizontal axis, do you have cancer, yes or no? That's just a matter of fact. Either the cancer cells are in your body or they're not. We're not going to talk about how much cancer, of what type. You have cancer or you don't. And then there's a test result. It either comes back positive or it comes back negative. Now, there's some ex examples where it's sort of indeterminate, but let's keep this simple positive or negative test result indicating you do or you do not have cancer. And that creates four possible futures or four possible uh, outcomes. You have cancer, this is the top left-hand corner, and the test comes back positive. It's a true positive. It's correct. The test comes back positive, says you have cancer, you actually have cancer. That's what the test is designed to do. The test is also designed, look in the bottom right-hand corner, to say if you don't have cancer, you actually don't. Right? So if somebody walks in, they don't have cancer in their body, they get a mammogram, the mammogram indicates they don't have cancer, it's done its job again. And that's why those two quadrants are colored green. Green is good, um, true positive, true negative. But two other possibilities are you don't have cancer, but the test in indicates that you do. That's called a false positive, and that's not good because then you are concerned, you're stressed out. You might get a biopsy or do something even more radical. It turns out you don't have cancer, but because of this positive indication, this false positive, um, you do the, some of those things. Or you actually have cancer, but it doesn't find it. That's called a false negative, and that's bad also because when are you going to get your next mammogram? Maybe not for two years, uh, and that cancer might have grown significantly in that period of time. Right. So false positives, false negatives are colored in red because those are bad. Now, just to let you know, these are sometimes called hits, misses, false alarms, or correct rejections. You might have heard the term false alarm. So I might use these terms um, interchangeably as I describe this. Um, but just to let you know, there's different ways of describing what these four quadrants represent. All right, so we have all the information we need to perform the calculation to determine what's the likelihood that a woman actually has cancer if a mammogram comes back with a positive result. So we know that the prevalence 
is 0.8% or eight out of a thousand. So in that column where it says, yes, have cancer, at the very bottom, all of those numbers, people who get positive and negative tests need to add up to eight, eight out of 1,000. That's in the bottom right-hand corner. Okay, so we know that eight women out of 1,000 uh, actually have cancer. Uh, and that means that 992 women don't have cancer in this example of mammograms, right? So the number of women who have cancer plus the number of women who don't have cancer needs to add up to 1,000. I gave you prevalence as 8%, so you can fill those in. Now, if we know the sensitivity of the test is 90%, then we know that nine times out of 10, we're gonna get a positive test result if the person has cancer. Now we don't have 10 in that first column, we have eight, so 90% of eight, nine times eight is 72, 7.2, can't have 0.2 women, so we're just gonna round to the closest integer. So we have seven out of eight, get a positive test result if the sensitivity is 90%. You know what we're gonna do next? We're gonna fill in that negative test result. One woman out of eight, who actually has cancer will not be found, right? So seven plus one equals eight. Let's do the same thing with specificity. The specificity is 93%. We know that means that 93% of the time it will give us a negative result for people that don't have cancer. It tells us accurately, 93% accurately, people who don't have cancer. So 93% of 992 is 923. Good thing I have my calculator for that one. And then you know what we're gonna do next, the math. <clears throat> 992 minus 923 equals 69. Okay, so now we've filled in the four quadrants and now we're gonna do a little bit more math. Seven plus 69 equals 76. One plus 923 equals 924. We check in that last column, the one for this one on the right, 76 plus 924 equals 1,000. It all adds up, our math is good. Now we can move forward. We've used prevalence. We've used sensitivity and we've used specificity, all the information that I gave you on that earlier slide, and now we can do the calculation. If a woman gets a positive test result, what's the likelihood she actually has cancer? So we know that 76 women are gonna get a positive test result. We know that seven women actually have cancer and 69 don't. Seven divided by 76 equals 9%. That's where it comes from. There's a lot of people that um, don't have cancer that are given a positive test result, right? Um, that's a false alarm. And so that's what mammograms produce, a lot of false alarms. But you'd rather be on the false alarm side. You'd rather be thinking you might have cancer and then take good steps moving forward than to assume you don't. And the good news is there's only one woman in the bottom left-hand corner that gets a negative test result that actually does have cancer. So we're erring in the right direction. But that's where the 9% come from, comes from. So if a woman's mammogram is positive, what's the likelihood she has cancer? A little less than 10%. So what do you do following a positive test result? Keep calm and get a second opinion. Now, a second opinion can be a couple of different things. One is it could mean you go to a different doctor. It's not because you don't trust your doctor. It's just you want a different set of eyes. You want a different, perhaps a different test. But even if you didn't get a different doctor, even if you didn't get a different test, you just went back in and got the exact same test again, that's the least you should do. Usually what happens is once you have a mammogram and you get a positive test result, they might, give, they might do a more invasive or more expensive test that has greater sensitivity, and greater specificity to help get that second test result. But even if you don't change your doctor and don't change your test, you should still get a second test. And let me explain to you why. So this is where we left, left we, this is where we left our matrix. Seven women got a positive test result um, who actually have cancer. Uh, out of the 76 total women who got a positive test result, 9% actually have cancer. Now what's interesting is our original base rate, our original prevalence was eight out of a thousand. But now that we have new information this is what Bayesian statistics is all about. Bayes' theorem is all about updating your statistics given new information. And now we have new information. So what we're gonna ask now is a different question. What is the prevalence of cancer among women who have tested positive with a mammogram? That's a very different question than the first question. 
Now we're asking, what is the prevalence of cancer among women who have tested positive with a mammogram? And we know what the answer is. It's 9%. It's not 0.8% out of 1,000. It's 9% of 1,000. So now we plug in these new numbers. Down at the bottom of the first column, we have 90. We do the math. So now we have 910 under the second column. And then we do exactly what we did before. The sensitivity of the test hasn't changed. The specificity of the test hasn't changed. The only thing that's changed is that prevalence, or what's sometimes called the base rate. And when we plug in the new numbers, we get a different estimate. And can you guess what it's going to be? What do you think that new number is going to be? So a woman goes in, she gets a positive result on a mammogram, 9% likelihood of actually having cancer. She goes back in, she gets a second test. That test comes back positive. Now what's the likelihood that she has cancer? Well, it's got to be above 9%. The answer is 56%, right? So if you look at the first column, remember how we took that 90, per, that number 90 in the bottom left-hand corner, we multiply it by 90% and this time we get 81 and then we get 81 plus nine equals 90. We still have 93% for specificity, 93% of 910 is 846. We do the math and get 64. And across that first row, 81, 64, 145, you do the math, it's jumped way up to 56%. So that's why in lots of different areas, if you test positive on something, you go in and get another test. In fact, this is what the NCAA does with athletes at universities. Let's say you're a division one athlete at Vanderbilt University and you pee in a cup and then they go and they measure your urine and they look for some drug and it tests positive for marijuana. You know what they do? Here's what they actually do. They take that initial urine sample and they split it up into two vials, call it A and call it B. If vial A comes back and it indicates positive for marijuana, they test vial B. And if that comes back positive, then you say, yeah, you had consumed marijuana within the last period of time. But if B comes back negative, well, then you have a very different test result. So the NCAA does it, uh, happens with COVID, happens with all kinds of testing go back and get a second test because the prevalence, the base rate has changed. We've updated our statistics. And with that new information, we can get a better um, conclusion. So if all of this is very difficult to understand, it's okay. One is I'm moving very, very quickly. Uh, the second is this is tough to understand. In fact, Daniel Kahneman, professor emeritus of psychology at Princeton University, and also Nobel Prize winner in economic sciences said, it came as a shock to me when I realized I was never taught how to use Bayesian statistics, and that even now I find it unnatural to do so. This guy's professor emeritus from one of the top universities in the world and a Nobel laureate. His brain is so big, he's got to hold it up. You can see it in the picture. And he says it's unnatural to do so. So if you're feeling about the mammograms and about 9% and 56% and testing doesn't quite make sense, it's okay. One, we're moving fast. And two, even Nobel laureates find it difficult to, to make sense of it. But that's what the course is all about, judgment and analytical reasoning. It's a recognition that we as human beings have these brains and our brains are good. But just like any other kind of computing system, there are bugs in the algorithms. It doesn't always quite work right. Optical illusions auditory illusions, cognitive illusions. But if you know what those issues are, then when you get presented with a problem, like I have to go in and get a test for anything, it could be a drug test, it could be a test for prostate cancer, it could be a test for, um, for breast cancer, and there's a possibility of a false positive, there's a possibility of false negative, right away you go, this is not intuitive. I'm gonna pull out my spreadsheet or an envelope with a, with a pen or pencil, I'm gonna draw my little quadrant, I'm gonna do the math, and I'm gonna see what the answers tell me analytically, and I'm gonna let that help guide my decision-making moving forward. So what I ask students to do is when they first learn about Bayesian statistics, they say, you need to write a paper now, and your paper is gonna be on any subject that you're interested in. And so students pick topics like um, birth control, or I'm sorry, uh, testing for pregnancy. And um, you pee on a stick if you're a woman and based upon the different types of hormones that are in your urine, it indicates you're pregnant or you're not, right? You're either pregnant or you're not. That's a matter of fact. And the test comes back positive or negative. 
And isn't this the perfect case? Wouldn't you want to open up this box and look at that really fine print inside of the, the directions and look for what's the sensitivity? What's the specificity? And then try to figure out and estimate what the prevalence is of, of women your age, right? 18 year old women versus 25 year old women versus 45 year old women. Because the accuracy of that test and being able to determine who's pregnant given a positive test result actually is based on the population you belong to. And that's counterintuitive as well. So some young women in my class do it on home pregnancy tests. Uh, you can imagine doing it on uh, metal detectors and other types of detectors at airports. You either have a gun on you or you don't. The, the alarm either sounds or it doesn't false alarms, correct rejections, you know, what is it? And then the example there with the specimen container of urine uh, for drug testing. So what else could you use Bayesian statistics for? What other kinds of examples? So other types of medical tests make sense. That's kind of easy to do. What goes beyond that though? And that's what students get to do. They get to think about how I can apply this to finance, how I can apply this to law, how I can apply this to sports, how I can apply this to all different kinds of fields. And that's what's fun about the class. Students come back, they've written a paper, and then we in class discuss all the different wide range of applications of Bayesian statistics. Students learn from each other about how widely applicable this is. And one I thought was really interesting was umpires calling balls and strikes. So when a pitcher throws a pitch, it goes into this little rectangle that's defined by the knees and the shoulders of the batter and the width of the plate and other kinds of things. I'm sure there's a little bit of uh, other factors that are taken into consideration. And then the umpire calls a ball or a strike. But a human being, using their own judgment, will make incorrect calls. So what is the sensitivity of an umpire? What is the specificity of an umpire? What is the prevalence of strikes among all pitches thrown? Think about justice. Think about our legal system. Uh, somebody either robbed the bank or committed the crime or they didn't. And then they're found guilty or they're found not guilty based upon the judgment of the jurors. And there are sometimes people who go to jail who shouldn't have. And sometimes there are people who don't go to jail who should have. And we hope to maximize the number of people that go to jail who are guilty and the number of people who don't go to jail who are not guilty. What is the sensitivity and the specificity of jurors, of the jury process or the trial process? What is the prevalence for an individual committing a particular crime? And so you can use Bayesian statistics to make those calculations as well. So what students do uh, is they learn about this cognitive illusion. Uh, they learn about Bayesian statistics. They learn how to do it on the back of an envelope, but then I teach them some Excel. And this is one of the very first homework assignments because it's relatively straightforward in Excel to create a bunch of cells um, that have equations in them. And that you can plug in things like sensitivity. You can see this in the yellow specificity and prevalence, and it does all the calculations. Um, it does it the way that we do it on the back of the envelope. It also uses formulas that we can compare the two. Uh, and then they can do a lot of what if scenarios. So if a drug sniffing dog um, sniffs out some marijuana in a high school locker, what's the likelihood there's actually marijuana in the locker? And one of the things you have to do is estimate prevalence. What is the prevalence of marijuana usage or people bringing it to school? Is it 1%, 10%, 50%? And so the great thing about Excel is you can run a lot of what if scenarios. And you can look at how the positive predicted value changes as a result of changes to sensitivity, specificity, and prevalence. That's what Excel is really good at, a lot of what-if scenarios. And then students can build a more intuitive sense for how much of an impact uh, increasing prevalence or decreasing prevalence will have on that positive predicted value. And then, of course, they have to write a paper. Uh, I keep it as a two-page paper just like this. This one happens to be on Bayesian statistics and an explanation and application to Down syndrome detection. So when women are pregnant, they can go in and get a test. They remove some of the fluid from within the uterus and they can determine um, with some degree of accuracy, right? The test has sensitivity and has specificity and there's a certain prevalence of children who have Down syndrome, um, whether or not they actually uh, have a child with Down syndrome or not. And this may have been personally relevant to this particular student. So it's a two page paper 
and they work, they describe uh, the problem, the cognitive illusion, they describe Bayesian statistics, then they apply it to a particular problem, and then they come back with a really great conclusion. It's fun for me as a professor because I learn about so many different interesting topics. And so this is just one example of the kind of thing that's taught in this course called Judgment and Analytical Reasoning, this combination of applied cognitive psychology and Microsoft Excel, so students develop analytic tools to help overcome limitations of human information processing. One of the other bonuses of the course is students actually pass the Microsoft certification exam for Excel at the expert level. That's a great thing to put on a resume, right? You don't just say, I'm proficient in Microsoft Office. You say, I'm certified expert in Excel. And when that employer says, really, what can you do with Excel? You talk about pivot tables, VLOOKUP tables, conditional formatting, students use Monte Carlo simulations, they do all kinds of things and they apply it to real world problems. So be able to drop that paper down in front of the prospective employer and say, this is the kind of work that I'm capable of doing. And what's important about this class and many other classes at Vanderbilt and I love this quote by Margaret Mead, who is a cultural anthropologist. She said, she said, children must be taught how to think, not what to think. It's not my job as a professor at Vanderbilt University to teach students what to think. It's for me to give them tools on how to think, how to think more objectively, how to think more rationally, even when there are challenges in the process of thinking itself. Thank you.